So I was born in May of 1991. I'm 33. There are Packers fans my age. Hell, there are Packers fans slightly older than me. Yep. That literally have no memories of having a bad football team to root for. Do you guys understand how awful that is? Not for Packers fans, but for the rest of football fandom. Do you guys understand what it's like to be bad? Do you realize that you're the villain? Like, do you get that? Does that go through your head ever when you're trying to fall asleep at night? Do you ever wake up and say, oh my God, we're the problem? You are. That's horse shit. I'm 33. They've never had a bad team to root for. What the fuck? (laughs) Don't I know it. And yet, and yet, they think they're persecuted. Oh, woe is us. This happened to us. It's terrible. I'm like, it's not. Try being a Bears fan, dude. Like, it's clearly not terrible, and it's not ever sustained terribleness. They just don't understand that concept unless they're 40. Two years plus old. Oh, we lost to the 49ers in the playoffs. Poor us. Like, dude, there's Jets fans out there that had to put their hopes and dreams (laughs) in Zach Wilson. Shut up. You're great. And I hate that you're great. (sighs) And they just keep being great. Three good quarterbacks in a row. Shouldn't happen. It's fucked up, man. Jay, roll the intro. Welcome to the Bootleg Football Podcast. I'm Brett. That's EJ. Regrettably, we have to say nice things about the Packers for the next hour or so. Uh, Not because we want to, but because we kind of have to. We have to acknowledge the reality that somehow, some way, Green Bay has built another juggernaut in a cave with a box of rookies. It's kind of stupid at this point, but they did it. They've done it again. And the only saving grace about us having to say good things for an hour is look away. There's a lot of good things to say. <laughs> they have really good coaches. They have players we like a lot. They know how to use those players to great effect. Like, ah! <laughs> you just got kicked from the Bears group chat <laughs> <laughs> just for saying that. No, yeah. there really is a, a lot of things to praise uh, in terms of how they built the roster, how they've drafted, how they've handled free agency, like even coaching hires. You know, the Jeff Halfley hire I thought was great. So there's just there's a lot to dig into today that is unfortunately for us very positive. Um, you know, we thought that we were going to get a year of reprieve in 2023. Uh, things started out shaky, you know, through weeks one through nine, which, again, it was a young team. We kind of expected that. And there were many Packer tears. There are many Packer tears, but I mean, shit, last year we titled this episode, The Packers Aren't Dead Yet. Little did we know, they're more than just not dead. They're very much alive because from week 10 onward, or really from Thanksgiving onward, yep. they were one of probably the six or seven best teams in the NFL. And Jordan Love went from, you know, again, in the first half of the season being a quarterback that we really weren't sure about to being a guy who, you know, now we're talking about him uh, getting $50 million a year in the span of like eight games or nine games or so. Uh, So things happen fast in the NFL. Things change very quickly in the NFL. And uh, we're looking at this Packers team with a very young core potentially making a run at not just the NFC North, but the NFC as a whole. So it's, it's real. And shit got real real quick. And not just for one year, but for multiple years with the way they're built, certainly with coaching. Matt Fleur is a very solid coach. Once you get your quarterback in place, the other young players that you drafted started to gel at the end of last season. And you look at it and you go, oh, this isn't a one-year window that was patched together with free agency money. This is a good, solid, young football team that, if they stay on this path, are going to be there not only this year, but for multiple years going into the future. Really quick, uh, before we dive into 2023 and all the good that happened last year, all the bad, all the much improved and in between, before we get into all that, I do want to thank Underdog Fantasy for helping to make this show possible in the first place. 
Uh, by the time this airs, we will be well into training camp and maybe even in the first week of preseason. I can't remember the exact date that, that these episodes are going live, but it'll be sometime in August. So football will be uh, very, very close, tantalizingly close. So if you're interested in doing any sort of season long pickums, there's a bunch of Packer options on Underdog Fantasy right now. Just kind of reading them off uh, over my left shoulder here. Uh, Jordan Love, again, the Jordan Love who we just praised a lot, is conspicuously low on passing yardage. Again, Underdog doesn't make these numbers. They just use these numbers, so don't shoot the messenger. Uh, but apparently popular opinion is 3,900 is the higher or lower for Jordan Love. Uh, you know what direction I'm going on that one. I think most Packers fans would agree with that. Uh, Josh Jacobs is at seven and a half rushing touchdowns or 1,025 rushing yards. Romeo Dubs is at 575 and a half receiving. Again, conspicuously low. Sorry, what? I know. Did that number start with a five? A five. Which, what you talking knowing about, Romeo Dubs against NFC North opponents, that's like three games. So, yeah, again, conspicuously low in the Packers offense. Don't really have an explanation for it. Uh, Christian Watson is at 750, and our friend Jane Reed is at 775. There is no Dontavian Wicks number, by the way, yet. I'm sure there will be. So, again, if you have any sort of faith in the Packers offense, uh, now is probably a good time to buy in because all the numbers are heavily suppressed for reasons we don't understand. Uh, and, of course, you can find those on Underdog Fantasy, or you can do, you know, pick every single Sunday for individual games. You can do baseball. You can do uh, best ball drafts if you're really big into best ball fantasy, as we are. Uh, there's a lot to offer on Underdog. So you can find that at the QR code on the screen or the description or at the link in the description. There we go. Brett, use English. Mm. It's been a long day. It was like the third episode we recorded today. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, thank you to Underdog for sponsoring today's show. Uh, again, if you guys use promo code bootleg, you'll get up to $250 in bonus cash and a free pick em special to boot. So hopefully you guys capitalize on that. And with that, EJ, take us through 2023. We will go through 2023, talk about the overall record of nine and eight. Again, a little deceptive. First half Packers and second half Packers, very different teams. Rank in the division, they came in second. Home record, five and three. Road record, four and five. Last five games, three and two. Got a couple of numbers to kind of help parse those results and say, hey, how did that happen? First one is QBS. If you've watched any other episodes in the series, you're familiar with it. It's called Quarterback Support. It's a stat I created in the second half of last season with Arjun Menon, who now works for the Jets. It's five rankings, three offensive, one defensive, and one special teams that really say, how well did a team set the table for their quarterback to play? How much support did they give him? It's a zero to 100 scale, zero's worst, 100's best. On that, the Packers were a 45.2, and that placed them 18th out of all 32 teams. The other number is power score, the one we introduced you to last year, which is simply assigning their league ranks for rushing offense, passing offense, rush defense, pass defense, points scored, and points allowed. We add those up, divide by six. A lower score is better. Obviously, everybody would like to be first in all those categories. Packers came in 10th in rushing offense, fourth in passing offense. Man, Matt LaFleur can call himself some offense. Rush defense, 21st. Pass defense, 23rd. Points scored, 12th. Points allowed, 10th. Now, if you add all those up, divide by six, you get a power score of 18.2, and that was 10th overall, and that created the fourth best positive difference between how well they set the table in QBS, that was 18th, and their overall results on the field, 10th, that's power score. Again, that was the fourth best positive differential in the league. Matt LaFleur can coach his ass off. That's it. And now that you know we're through almost every single team in the league, when looking at the differentials between QBS and power score, the biggest theme that I'm seeing is – the teams that are way in the negative and differential and the teams that are way in the positive and differential, it's really determined by head coach and quarterback combination. And I think, if anything, these two numbers best represent the advantage or disadvantage that you have as an organization when you don't have that combo. And the Packers having, you know, LaFleur and, and Jordan Love, who came on in the back half of last year, that kind of made up for a lot of ground, you know, especially for a defense that was 
way up and down for a variety of reasons. That's why there's a new DC there. Uh, you know, a, a very young offense with young weapons, young offensive linemen. When you have the guy at head coach and the guy at quarterback, the rest just kind of falls into place regardless of what's around it. So, you know, you, you see the teams like, say, the Falcons, right, that had great offensive line, great weapons, tons of talent on defense, but they didn't have a good head coach quarterback combo. In fact, they had one of the worst in the league and they were the Packers, but opposite. They were the bizarro Packers where they should have been, you know, a playoff team, but massively underperformed and had a top 10 pick. So I, I think if anything, this whole series has really shined a light on if you don't have a head coach and a quarterback, you don't really have anything. And that's the way you make up the difference. That's the way you plaster over a lot of holes in the walls in the modern NFL. If you can throw together a passing game and score some points, that largely comes from usually a head coach who is your play caller and your quarterback or a very good OC in the case of Detroit with Ben Johnson. If you can have that relationship where you have a very effective passing game, you can stress other teams' pass defenses, and you can put points on the board, you can do a lot of other things really averagely, like defending the run. You can be in the low 20s, and it doesn't matter. There's really only a couple teams that are outliers in that trend, and it's like Detroit. They had a terrible passing defense, but they also had a great passing offense, and so every week was just a, we think we can get to 35 before you can, and they were correct, but you know the Packers are one of those teams where they were a lot more balanced and you know, we saw that balance on full display in the last couple months of the season. Uh, I do have some fun numbers for you, by the way, to kind of give more context for uh, all the EPA numbers and, and, and power score and everything like that. Because a lot of people are wondering, OK, why was Jordan Love good? Like what what actually made him all of a sudden turn it on? What the hell happened? What the hell happened? That was the big question. The question wasn't, is he good? The question is, where the fuck did that come from? Right, because the first couple of months were very shaky. And while doing research for this episode, I didn't really see any sort of difference in terms of personnel tendencies, alignment tendencies, schematic tendencies. Like the offense didn't change from the first half to the second half of the year. What changed was just Jordan Love's comfort with it, right? And this is an offense that is pretty difficult to run. Uh, it's not quite uh, Brock Purdy, Joe Burrow difficulty level in terms of of how much those two offenses put on, on their respective shoulders. But uh, there is a pretty high degree of difficulty nonetheless, because this is an offense that uh, doesn't spread you out pretty much ever. Uh, everything's very condensed. You know, it's a lot of two by two with everybody well inside the numbers. Uh, it's a lot of 12 personnel. They ran more 12 personnel than all but two other teams. It's a very play-action heavy offense, but uh, not necessarily play-action that's going to create space. Uh, it's more so play-action that's just going to uh, give Jordan Love time so that he can then roll out and then find guys while he's on the move. Uh, it's, it's a different different kind of play action. Like there's some teams that use play action to basically vacate the middle of the field uh, or vacate the seams. Uh, the Packers use play action more so so that they could just buy time for Jordan Love to hit deep shots down the field, which he wasn't really hitting early on. And then he couldn't miss by the end of the year. Um, but even in just their normal drop back pass game, it's so fascinating. You look at like their, their heat map. They really didn't work the seam areas. They only had high difficulty throws, um, whether it was down the field outside the numbers, you know, trying to hit back shoulder fades or in some cases hitting super difficult, like outbreaking routes from the far hash. If you watch the Steelers game, Packers fans, which I'm sure you did, you remember that touchdown he threw in week 10, end of the first quarter against the Steelers, which was an outrageous throw, like just the audacity of it, you know, uh, I, I couldn't believe he hit it. And that was honestly one of the first throws I was like, uh, okay, that's, a, that's a little different. <laughs> right. And then of course next week and next week and next week and next week. And he just kept building on that. But that was one of the first throws of the year where I was like, Oh shit, he, uh -oh. he might've figured this out. And so they were having him, you know, try these really, really high difficulty throws, uh, as well as, you know, higher difficulty throws over the middle, not necessarily in terms of, 
you know, distance, but in terms of threading it in between defenders, there there just wasn't a lot of easy stuff here. Like even in their play action game, it wasn't easy stuff that's designed to manufacture space like we see, we see in other offenses. You know, there wasn't a, a bunch of manufactured touches in, in the screen game uh, like we like we saw a lot of teams do. There was a lot on his plate, not to mention it's a very motion heavy offense as well. Now, all that kind of adds together to create a very tough offense for a young quarterback to grasp because there's a lot of moving parts. And when you have a motion heavy offense that isn't really spread out, the picture's going to change on you really quickly because all the bodies are condensed, right? If you're condensed on offense, they're going to be condensed on defense. So all the bodies are condensed. So the picture's muddy as it is. Then you throw in motion and there's safeties and DBs and linebackers moving all over the place to respond to your motions. You're not really sure what picture you're getting. And ultimately, I think that's where, you know, his sudden spike came from. It wasn't that they changed anything schematically. They didn't change anything. It was the fact that there was something about like week nine into week 10 where it finally clicked for him. Mm-hmm. You know, where it where he just finally figured out how defenses were responding to all the motion so he could better anticipate what he was going to see. He was better at, you know, just reading things quickly and finding space quickly, because this is the kind of offense where it's really more about finding space and finding levers than anything else. Um, he was better pre-snap. He was better post-snap. He was more accurate. He was more comfortable, you know, throwing under pressure. I think at that point, he just kind of stopped caring. He just knew he was going to get hit. So he's like, fuck it, we ball. And there was just something that happened in that two week time period or even one week time period where it just clicked. I don't know what it is. I'm not even sure if Jordan could explain it to you, but all of a sudden he just figured it out. They didn't do anything different. He was just different out of nowhere. And that sucks, man, because so many teams <laughs> want that. So many teams want a quarterback that just figures it out magically, and he's one of the very few that ever went from not having it to having it basically overnight. Yeah, and it wasn't overnight. It was the whole first half of the uh, yeah, season. Yeah, the overnight success that takes four years. I know, I know. But this is how people talk about young quarterbacks making that jump. They talk about the light coming on, the switch flipping, you know, the game slowing down, things understanding. And that's what happened for Jordan. For whatever reason it happened for, that's exactly what happened for Jordan Love. And you said comfort, and the comfort led to speed. Mm -hmm. It's a, so what happened and what does that mean? What happened was comfort. He started to understand all those things. He started to get comfortable. And then that comfort led to speed. And that was speed of processing, speed of understanding things, pre-snap, post-snap. That gave him more time effectively to throw the ball. That made him look the way he looked in the second half of the season, which was comfortable, unstressed, on time, on target. It just all slowed down for him. He got comfortable and then he went, oh wait. It's like he could hit the like the time delay button in a video game and go, oh, I get it, cool, no problem. I know where I'm going. And then he could complete those throws with what looked like relative ease, especially compared to the first half of the season. And yeah, it's difficult to see as a Bears fan, for sure. It's really cool to see for Jordan Love as a player, seeing that progression. Like you said, that's what everyone wants for young quarterbacks, but it doesn't happen for a lot of them ever. And we got to watch it in real time last season. Starting in week 10 uh, through the end of the regular season, His big time throw percentage was number one in the NFL at 7.5%. That is a monster number, folks. That's like double the average. Okay. All the freaking time. Like literally all the time. He was just throwing dimes. Dimes into tight spaces, down the field, right? He had a 20 to 3 touchdown to interception ratio starting in, in week 10. Like we're talking... MVP type numbers over the back half of the year. If he kept up that pace the entire year, he probably would have won MVP. Yep. Because that's like Aaron Rodgers type numbers. Yeah. It's just unreal. And, you know, again, good for him. You know, he kind of bet on himself uh, with the the contract 
was it's not really an extension uh re not even restructure it was a give us time yeah it was just kind of a let's see where this goes type deal and and he bet on himself that that he could parlay that bought time into a mega mega ultra super crazy deal which he's probably going to get uh, yep. but also at the same time if he keeps playing like that it's probably worth it <laughs> like it's he was just at an unconscious level uh, over the back half of the year and it just finally clicked for him uh, as far as defensive tendencies i i normally would have taken the time here to go over a bunch of schematic information for for how the packers defense operated last year and how that's going to translate to to next year but it's a new dc and there's a lot of new personnel and we don't really know what Jeff Halfley is going to do. We could take a guess that they're going to be super aggressive and, you know, major in single high safety structures like what he's done before and, you know, emphasize more penetration and disruption and then having, you know, a bunch of range and speed on the back end to clean up after that penetration. That seems to be what he's done in the past, but uh, we are not sure truth be told. So that's something that we're going to have to circle back to kind of in the middle of the season. And, and of course, we will keep you updated on on what we see from him tendency wise. But I have to imagine at least just looking at the personnel, something that will be emphasized is penetration, speed on the second level, and then versatile safeties that can play either uh, forward or backwards, or rather, I should say, either as a quasi nickel or as a free safety. Uh, and probably play both roles interchangeably because they're going to play a left and a right safety. Um, that's about all I got. I, I, I don't really know much else other than that. And uh, I'm just excited to see what they do. Packers fans, if you want a quick insight into what Halfley might do, follow Coach Dan Casey on Twitter. He's been posting some of Halfley's best plays from his time in college imagining that they'll carry over to his time with the Packers. So that give you might give you a little head start on some of your friends on figuring out what the Packers are going to do on defense this year. But again, we are going to learn that. He's going to learn the players he has. Uh, the speed of the game is certainly going to increase for him as well, coming from college to the pros. And he'll make those adjustments. But yeah, he's going to bring some of those tendencies and you might get a little peek behind the curtain if you follow Coach Casey. All I know is Edron Cooper was brought there to blitz. <laughs> and to blitz again and to blitz again and again and again because uh, that is that is his role his role is go get in the backfield edge and he's going to say sir yes sir and i'm still kind of pissed that they got him because i really liked edger and cooper god damn it <laughs> <sighs> anyway let's move on to the front office of coaching staff uh let's talk about the guy who drafted edger and cooper amongst is it among or amongst I'll take, I'll take either at this point. We're almost on our last episode. I am not going to be a grammar stickler. How about this? Among other rookies uh, that we also liked, uh, let's talk about the GM that brought him in. Brian Gutekunst leading the Packers. Uh, another successful haul this year in the draft. We'll talk more about that as we get to the draft section specifically and focus on who those players are. But he has kept the roster stocked. Certainly taken some lumps over his time for not making certain moves, especially when Aaron Rodgers was in town. He's been proven correct on the wide receiver issue, though. He has stocked that wide receiver room with young and diverse talent. A lot of wide receivers we really liked in the pre-draft process when they were coming out, and they are starting to blossom right along with Jordan Love. It did take a bunch of patience by the organization, and they should be credited for that. A lot of organizations would have had a quicker pull, quicker trigger to yank some of those guys. They stuck with them, and they are reaping the benefits right now. Head coach Matt LaFleur, I talked about him a little bit earlier. I feel like I need to talk about him a little bit more because people just tend to forget. I don't know if it's because Green Bay is a small market or if they haven't made any noise in the playoffs. I don't know what it is. Matt LaFleur is a hell of a coach. I hate the fact that he's in a division with my favorite team because there are no easy games against him. He has his teams prepared. He brought a young quarterback along much more quickly than I hoped he would be able to. He's a very, very talented coach, and Green Bay is lucky to have him. It wasn't even just a young quarterback that he brought along quickly. It was young receivers, young tight ends, young everything, right? Like, he's he's just a great teacher. Yep. And, and clearly all of that – young talent wouldn't have been able to perform like they did as quickly as they did without a guy like Matt LaFleur 
that could sit there and and translate NFL football to them because most of them were rookies. Like it was more high impact rookies on this offense that I can remember in a long time. And I'm I'm sort of kind of counting Jordan Love as a rookie because he hadn't even played 16 games yet going into this year. So okay, we'll count him as a, a senior rookie. But uh, th- there was just so much youth and, and so much inexperience. And by literally 75 percent into this year it looked like they'd all been playing together for five seasons. And an incredibly steady hand at the helm. Again, Packers fans, consider yourself extremely lucky that Matt Lafleur is in town. Offensive coordinators, Adam Stenovich. Defensive coordinator, as we said, just Jeff Halfley. Special teams coordinator, Rich Passaccia, came over from the Raiders after his stint there a couple of years ago. On offense, notable coaches, Tom Clements, the QB coach, worked with Aaron Rodgers previously, also Kyler Murray, Came back to the Packers in 22. Has been an OC twice in the NFL, Packers and Bills. Very, very experienced coach. Luke Butkus is the offensive line coach. Packers offensive line is freaking annoying. I, there's just no <laughs> other way to say it. They are always extremely well prepared. They seem to overachieve no matter what happens, no matter how many injuries, no matter how many rotations. Players playing other positions being drafted well below where you think they should be and overperforming. A lot of that falls with Luke Butkus. He is Dick's nephew, for those that are curious. Yeah, how many Butkuses are out there running around? Probably not many. Well, we almost mixed up the Switzers earlier, so I just want to be clear. James Vrabel, pass game coordinator, has been with Green Bay since 2019. He's been promoted twice since then. Played QB at Marietta College in Ohio. First time I think I've heard of Marietta. I assume that's related to the other Vrabel, right? Mike Vrabel? I looked, but I couldn't I couldn't confirm or deny that. Because again, not that many Buckuses in the world, probably not that many Vrabels either. Uh, it was my first thought, but I couldn't find confirmation. Sean Mannion is also an offensive assistant. Yes, that Sean Mannion. Played from 2015 to 20, uh, 2023, was originally a third round selection by the Rams in 2015. Fresh off his playing career. He joins the Packers staff as a coach. Not all that surprising. On defense and special teams, Derek Ansley is the defensive pass game coordinator. He was with the Chargers for the last three years, spent 23 as their DC, was coaching DBs at Alabama when Minka was there, also coached at Tennessee and Kentucky in the college ranks. And Anthony Campanelli is the linebackers coach and defensive run game coordinator. First year with the Packers, coached the linebackers for Miami for the last four years. That's the Miami Dolphins, not University of Miami. It's a very strong staff, uh, annoyingly strong, some might (laughs) say. Uh, But again, they've they've done a good job putting it together. Uh, So looking at all those coaches, looking at, you know, the schemes uh, or the schematic tendencies, I should say, that they lean into in terms of personnel and, you know, how they line up and how they generate explosive plays and, and everything like that that we've gone over. Uh, we want to use that information for our underdog top three, which is a segment that we do every single show, which is we feed you a bunch of information and then we tell you how that translates to fantasy football, at least in terms of finding values in fantasy football. You know, guys like Jordan Love, he's QB 10. (laughs) Uh, You're not getting a value on Jordan Love. He is appropriately valued. Uh, And I would even say Christian Watson and Dubs are appropriately valued. But it doesn't mean that there are not values to be had. Starting off first, Marshawn Lloyd, he's at RB45, which if you compare that to Josh Jacobs, who's at RB12, not that I think Jacobs is going to fall flat on his face, like they paid him money for a reason, he will have a role. Uh, If anything, he's gonna be the goal line workhorse at a minimum, like that seven and a half touchdown number that we saw on underdog for the season long pickums, like that is low in my estimation because he's going to get a lot more opportunities uh, than you might think, and he will be the primary goal line back. Uh, but at the same time, RB12 overall, I think implies a workload in between the 20s and on third down that I don't think he's going to get. Uh, in fact, I would say Marshawn Lynch is going to have a much heavier role than RB5 or RB45 would imply. So they're probably closer to each other than you think, at least in terms of, of of value in my estimation. I think Jacobs is a little bit overvalued right now, and I think Marshawn Lloyd is undervalued right now. 
especially if you're looking at this run scheme. You know, this is a team that uh, has traditionally used different running backs for different things. You know, like Aaron Jones was the outside zone guy when he was there. A.J. Dillon was more for inside zone and duo. Those were their top three run concepts were outside zone, inside zone, and duo. And really, there's not a whole lot of difference between inside zone and duo. It's more so, okay, do we need the battering ram uh, to hit up and inside the tackles, or do we want somebody who's got better feet um, and you know better speed to try to hit the front side of these outside zone uh, runs or have the foot or have the feet so that he can cut back on a dime quickly and, and hit that backside cutback lane if it presents itself. Dylan could not and still cannot. And to be honest, Marshawn Lloyd is better at that than even Josh Jacobs is. If we're talking about who's going to handle all the outside zone stuff for them, I would say that's Marshawn Lloyd. If we're talking about who's going to handle the receiving stuff for them, I would say that's Marshawn Lloyd. If we're talking about who's going to be the jet sweep guy for them, which is also a role that they've had a few different running backs play in the past, including Aaron Jones. I would say that's Marshawn Lloyd when they're in their two back looks. I think it's fair to say Josh Jacobs is going to get all the AJ Dillon stuff, but more of it, but it doesn't mean that Marshawn Lloyd will be relegated to a, uh, a far off number two. They're both going to eat. They're both going to get opportunities. I just think that Marshawn Lloyd his, op- his particular opportunities are not being considered uh, as highly as they should be. I'm not surprised, given your pre-draft grade on Marshawn Lloyd. Oh, I was a huge Marshawn Lloyd guy. He's got great feet. He's really explosive. Like the one issue, you know, fumbling, I get it. Um, some, would, some would compare his profile to Chase Brown, but I thought he was way better than Chase Brown coming out. Loved his feet, loved his vision. I mean, especially in a 225 pound back, like he's bigger than I think he gets given credit for. I mean, he doesn't look big, but he is dense while also being explosive. I don't know. He's built for that kind of stuff. And I just, I feel like he's being way overlooked because people look at the money that was given to Josh Jacobs as if that's the end all be all. What's the end all be all is who's the better fit for that kind of stuff. And between the two of them, it's it's Marshawn to me. I think they are closer than certainly they're ranked right now. I don't know that I think they're as close as you think they are, especially not at the beginning of the season. By the end of the season, I could see that gap being what you see it to be. Josh Jacobs is really freaking good. And I think they are gonna try and limit load on him. And that is a plus for Marshawn Lloyd. Um, I don't know that we're going to see those returns early, so you might have to be a little bit patient if you draft Marshawn Lloyd. Might come on a little bit later, but he is extremely explosive. He can take it the distance. He can run through contact. And, yeah, the Packers have traditionally separated those roles, not necessarily between one back, but between two different types of backs and used them very specifically. So that lends to your argument for sure. I just remember once upon a time, there was a young Aaron Jones. Correct. That a lot of people were like, I don't, I don't know about that. Like, again, he's going to be I the was backup. Not one of those he, people. No, you were. <laughs> you were president of the Aaron Jones fan club. That's true. But, you know, both of us were like, I don't know. This, this kid out of UTEP is really freaking good. I think he's going to get opportunities. And there were a bunch of guys ahead of him. And everybody's thinking like, ah, I don't know. Like there's, <laughs> there's money being spent elsewhere and there's, you know, high draft picks being used elsewhere. Yep. But at the end of the day, if you're the best player and he was the best player in their backfield, you're eventually going to get snaps. And once he started getting snaps, you know, say what you want about Aaron Rodgers, the GM, he did advocate for Aaron Jones a lot. Uh, And once Aaron Jones got snaps, that was it. That was that. That was it. And I think it's going to be the same thing for Marshawn Lloyd. Like once he gets in the field, I don't think he's going to get off. Uh, as far as ones, or as far as a, a value play that I do think we agree on, at least we should agree on, based on our mutual admiration for this player, Dontavian Wicks. Believe it or not, folks, he is wide receiver sixty right now, which feels not nah, very low if you're looking at <laughs> at the trajectory of the play over the back half of the year. Yeah, he and Jordan Love seem to have a very good connection. He's super talented. He lines up inside, he lines up outside. We know the Packers in general are obsessed with him. You could say Jaden Reed here, 
you could say Dubs, you could say Christian Watson, but if we're just talking about pure value, like how much production is there going to be for where you're getting him at? You're getting Dontavian Wicks super late, and he's probably going to end up being one of their, not even three, maybe even one of their two most productive receivers. My question for everybody that questions Dontavian Wicks is, where would you have taken Tyler Boyd in the Bengals offense two years ago? Two years ago, like Jamar's rookie year? Yeah. Uh, he wasn't wide receiver 60. He was probably going in the 40s, I would say. It's commensurate value. About, yeah. Yeah. Like, I would be completely comfortable with Wicks anywhere from 45 on. And maybe, honestly, if I'm being really honest, like sneaky honest, a little bit before that, he's going to be super productive. The Bears have three receivers in the top 38. Which is overvalued, but Wix is no, that, wildly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like you're getting mm-hmm. you're getting the Bears wide receiver three 22 picks ahead of Dontavian Wix. Feels a little bit sus. Yeah. No. And, I, and I say that loving all the Bears receivers. Yeah. I'm just saying Dontavian Wix doesn't get pub. Yeah, it's Wix at 60, which is really the issue. It's too freaking low. Run, don't walk to your computer to pick up that value right now. You will profit. And then finally, Luke Musgrave, who I think made this list last year, too, just because they literally (laughs) didn't have any other tight ends going into last year. They just drafted a bunch of kids and say, we're going to figure this out. Uh, And so Luke Musgrave is returning to our our value plays for the second year in a row. He is TE17, which for an offense that emphasizes tight ends as much as this one does, let alone tight ends that are 6'6", 250, and run like a gazelle. Uh, That also seems very low to me. I would not be surprised if he's uh, one of their primary red zone threats by the end of the year. If he stays healthy, I think he will outperform that rating. Not by as much as Dontavian Wicks will outperform wide receiver 60, but it's still a slice of value that you can go out and get right now. Well, right now being when you're viewing this, go check the ADP. It may well have changed, but... At TE17, I think he's going to outperform that. Yeah, again, we're recording this on July 10th. um, So by the time this goes live, things may have shifted. Especially once we see preseason games, that's usually where uh, everything kind of gets turned upside down when it comes to to unknown receiving cores. So uh, just just check it out and proceed accordingly. How about that? Um, All right, let's get to free agency. You know, kind of leaving 2023 in the past. Let's let's talk about how they set up for 2024. There's some tough decisions to be made. Uh, some franchise, I don't know if I'll say legends, franchise staples. Pillars. Were, yeah, pillars, that's a good word, that were moved on from, but also very necessary to move on from at this point. Uh, there was nothing on this list as tough as it was to say goodbye. There was still nothing on this list that made me think uh, they can't come back from this player no longer being there. Yeah, for me, it's more the overall weight of all the names when you look at them put together. Uh, Rudy Ford, the safety, played 50.9% of the snaps. Not a franchise pillar, by the way. Not a franchise pillar, (laughs) but did play over 50% of the snaps last season. David Bakhtiari, his most recent impact probably doesn't have any Packers fans pining to have him back again this season, but his overall franchise impact Puts him on this list. Devondre Campbell is now with the 49ers. Again, played just over 50% of the snaps. Jonathan Owens, the other safety, is now bare. So, yes, you can hate on him all you'd like. Played almost 70% of the snaps. John Runyon Jr., left guard, is now a giant. Played 85% of the snaps for the Packers last year. Darnell Savage, a third safety on this list, is now with the Jaguars. Again, just over 50% of the snaps. Yash Nyman, the left tackle, is with the Panthers. Only 21% of the snaps, but was a valuable backup for the Packers. And, of course, Aaron Jones. If we're talking about franchise pillars, he's the one that really moves the needle on this list. He is now with the Vikings again. Throw all the hate his way that you'd like that he's now wearing purple. But I probably, like you, if you're being honest, don't think Aaron Jones is done. Also, the reason we know he's a franchise pillar for Green Bay is because he went to Minnesota. He, He took his pilgrimage at the end of his career uh, over to Minneapolis, <laughs> like all great Packers do, you know, it was, it was inevitable. It's going to happen. What, what do non-great Packers do? Do they show up in Chicago? Uh, they go happens? to the jets. Uh, and then occasionally <laughs> they'll make a stop. Over Shots <laughs> fired. Yikes. Uh, uh, I had to. Sorry. 
<laughs> Mr. Coleman could not resist. Let the record show. Uh, in terms of who they actually did bring back uh, in terms of in-house retentions and third-party acquisitions, uh, Corey Ballantyne brought back uh, at a very reasonable $2.1 million deal. Uh, A.J. Dillon, again, I don't think he's going to have a huge role just because the two backs in front of him are so much better, but he's brought back to be RB3. Uh, Kayshawn Nixon uh, is brought back as well at $6 million. He's going to be a starting uh, starting corner for them. Preston Smith brought back at about $12.5 million, which given the current edge market for somebody who's been consistently productive for a long time, like, yeah, I get it. That's, that's cool with me. And then for third-party additions, Xavier McKinney, this was uh, the first of two big money moves. They made $16.75 million. Very versatile safety, which, again, just based on our guesstimations of, of the type of defense, they're going to run here where you have to have a safety that can be just as comfortable playing down low in the slot, blitzing, playing the run as he is being a free safety. Xavier McKinney qualifies for that as somebody who can do a little bit of both, uh, as all great modern safeties do. Uh, and then Josh Jacobs, who we talked about at $12 million near the top, of, well, near the top of what used to be the running back market, <laughs> kind of exploded in the last uh, couple months here, but. You know, pretty good value signing overall. And, of course, Greg Joseph, uh, you know, bringing him in uh, at $1.3 million. I would say it, it, they were cons- well, not conservative. They were responsible in free agency this year. And I think that was deliberate because they know what kind of money is about to come down the pipe uh, for Jordan Love. So they're like, OK, let's not let's not outkick our coverage here. Let's. Let's give ourselves some flexibility so that we can move uh, or so that we can position this Jordan Love deal in a way that is team friendly. And I do expect it to be team friendly. Well, as team friendly as (laughs) any big money quarterback deal will be. But it it definitely feels like they could have spent more, but they held back a little bit uh, knowing that they're about to uh, have a very, very, very expensive quarterback again. Yeah, the Xavier McKinney move was the move that I laughed about publicly and cried about privately (laughs) because I was like, ha ha, the Packers spent almost $17 million on a safety privately. Damn it. He's a really good tackler and a solid player. I was really hoping for some leaky holes in the Packers secondary, and it's not going to happen now that Xavier McKinney's there. And Andre Dillard at left tackle, look hasn't achieved any heights in his professional career that people thought he might achieve when he was coming out in the draft. If he doesn't hit with the Packers, I will be shocked. Speaking of absolutely going to hit with the Packers, by the way, uh, God, what a draft. I know. This is, uh, hang on a second. (laughs) You poured yourself a drink? Another drink. Was that the Balcones? This is the Balcones, True Blue. It's good stuff, by the way. It's very tasty and it's very necessary because, damn it, this is another good draft from Green Bay. And if you followed my draft coverage for a long time, you know that Green Bay typically picks a lot of players who I really like, and they did it again this year. So once again, we'll go through the entire list, and I'll try and suppress my vicious anger (laughs) about Goody and his staff picking up great players. But we'll start off with Jordan Morgan. The offensive tackle from Arizona. They get him at the end of the first round, 25th pick overall. Oh, he, hold on. Can you believe the Packers fans were upset by that, by the way, on draft night? That was the reaction that I was most surprised by. You and I at the time were like, ah, shit. They got another versatile offensive lineman that can play either tackle or guard. Uh, we were very high on that pick at the time. It felt like Packers fans, I don't know what they were expecting, but for me, that was a very Packers pick in that I thought it was really good. So Packers fans, feel free to let me know if you disagree, but at least it felt to me on draft night that that was a, a, a negatively received selection that should have been positively received. One of the biggest comparisons for Jordan Morgan in the pre-draft process was Brian Belaga. Yeah, shocker. So the Packers pick good offensive line move, great core strength. Yeah, not necessarily <laughs> the longest arms. There you go. Very talented player. I think he will absolutely develop. Edgerin Cooper, the linebacker from Texas A&M in the second round at 45. We interviewed Edge at the Shrine Bowl. Really like his explosive playmaking component. He was my second ranked inside linebacker in this draft. And honestly, if Peyton Wilson can't stay healthy, 
He's going to be the first ranked inside linebacker in this draft. Absolute missile as a blitzer. Can cover to the outside, not necessarily his strength. Certainly has the capacity to do it, but is an everywhere, every time, everything tackling machine and a complete disruptor. Javon Bullard, safety, Georgia. This is the double damn it. It sucks. They go out in free agency. They get Xavier McKinney, a very good, and as we said, very solid safety. They go out in the draft, and they add Javon Bullard, one of the best safeties in the entire draft, explosive playmaker, proven track record in the SEC. Hate, hate, hate the fact that he is a Packer because I love the player. He is fantastic, and safety goes from an absolute weakness last year to an absolute strength in the course of like two months. This was the pick that came in and we're both like, come on. Like seriously, we get no reprieve at all. Get off our lists. And then of course they go Marshawn Lloyd, the running back from USC in the third round at 88. And you get to go off about that because you were a huge Marshawn Lloyd guy. He played right over there at USC. Super explosive, was one of my top three running backs, maybe top two in this class. He should have been. <laughs> he should have been. <laughs> Listen to you. Anyways, he also ends up in their backfield. Tyron Hopper, linebacker from Missouri. I reached out to a Missouri fan during the pre-draft process, and I said, man, I just watched Tyron Hopper. What are you, You've watched him for three, four years now. What are your opinions of Hopper? And his view lined up with mine. As such, third round, 91, felt a little bit early. Very good, solid linebacker who didn't necessarily achieve the heights they hoped for him at Missouri. But again, inside linebackers with a somewhat limited athletic profile that show up. Who's that sound like? Um, Devondre Campbell? Devondre Campbell. (laughs) Weird. I was like, oh, as soon as the Packers picked him, oh, it's the new Devondre Campbell. Great. Moving on. Evan Williams, the safety from Oregon in the fourth round at 111. This was one of my sleepers throughout the draft. Occasionally, I send out receipts to other friends I have in the industry, and I say, hey, I think this guy's being underrated. Evan Williams was one of those guys. TFL machine, absolute physical force, was at his pro day in Oregon. They just keep adding to the defensive backfield, and I'm like, could you stop? Yeah, they have like six safeties now. It's dumb. It's dumb. Jacob Monk, the center from Duke, didn't watch Monk. Fifth round, 163. Any thoughts on Jacob Monk? Uh, I actually did not get to him, which is ironic because I watched his teammate extensively, Graham Barton. Never watched Jacob Monk. I, I think Barton pulled most of the views there. Again, they come back later in the fifth round and get Keaton Oladapo, the safety from Oregon State. Another player on my underrated list. I actually sat next to Keaton's mom at the pro day. And he is a big, rangy, physical, fast defender that for some reason people didn't pay attention to. Guy made a hell of a lot of plays. This is a great pick by the Packers. I'm getting tired of saying that. <laughs> Travis Glover, the offensive tackle from Georgia State in the sixth round at 202. Massive player. Michael Pratt, the quarterback from Tulane in the seventh round. This was much later than I thought Pratt was going to go. I really don't know why he went this late too. Like there was a lot of people that saying that were saying he could have gone starting in the third and it would have made sense. Like at least in the fourth, that was the wheelhouse for a lot of people. And to see him go in the seventh with no real explanation, whether it was medicals or what, like we just, I, I still don't know. I don't know either. Great sense of timing can absolutely spin it. Very accurate quarterback. Wasn't the most productive if you're just looking at numbers, but if you look at tape and, again, the individual plays he made, it's all there, folks. He can absolutely be a backup quarterback in the NFL. And then Kalen King, the cornerback from Penn State in the seventh round at 255. Folks, Kalen King was on a lot of preseason All-America lists or watch lists necessarily. He was projected to go much, much higher than this. This is a tremendous value. The Packers cleaned up at the end of the draft. I'll tell you what, I I had a very low grade on Kalen King because tape was not kind to him. Let's just say that. And and neither was the all-star process or the combine. He just, the last 12 months were not good for him. That being said, the fact that he's in Green Bay means that he's going to be good. 
because of course he will. Uh, it's always the corners in Green Bay that you don't expect that end up working out. <laughs> uh, so future Pro Bowler Kalen King, mark that one down. So after praising their entire rookie class and their coaching staff oh. and their free agent signings and last year's rookies and their quarterback. This is and, so and, painful. And, <laughs> After singing the praises of the evil empire for an hour plus at this point, that brings us to our last segment, which is where we have to answer the question, did this team that was already a pain in the ass get better? And we answer that with either a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or a thumbs even. For me, even though they looked like one of the six or seven best teams in the NFL to close last year, which is a very high bar to clear, I only think they got better this offseason even with the loss of Aaron Jones. If you're looking at the Marshawn Lloyd pickup, the Josh Jacobs pickup, really their entire rookie class, plus, of course, Jordan Love just being Superman all of a sudden, I'm going to go with thumbs up here. And that is a terrifying thought yep. because it looked like the Lions were about to be locked in for a reign of at least short-term dominance over the NFC North uh, while, while the young Bears got going. Uh, I would say the Packers have something to say about that. A little bit, and probably a little bit more than a little bit. So if you've listened to us for the last 45 minutes or an hour, I mean, I'm not even going to say it. I'm just going to like <laughs> just just flash the thumbs up and, and move on. It's ugly. I don't love it, but it is absolutely true. We are objective on this podcast, and there's no way to look at this Packers team and say it didn't get better. So for ceiling and floor, again, we're going to be equally optimistic. Uh, and realistic about it. My ceiling is 12, which I know might seem like I'm putting a damper on things because there's some people in Packerland that are expecting 13, 14 wins. That is really hard to do, uh, especially, you know, with a schedule like the Packers have. There's there's some pretty rough games in there. Not that they can't win them, but it's not a cakewalk of a schedule, nope. in my opinion, which if you watch this entire series, you know, we've talked about pretty much all their opponents at this point. You should know that they they have some really talented uh, some some really talented teams on their schedule. So I would say twelve is good, as in if they reach twelve wins with that schedule, that is good. Yep, they're going to be in contention for the first seed. I don't know if they're going to get the first seed, but they'll at least make the playoffs. So again, I'm going a ceiling of twelve, and here's the real mark of a great team: it's floor. For me, I'm going to go with a floor of ten, and this is. Barring an injury to Jordan Love, who we know is, is a very important factor, if we take out the possibility of quarterback injury, just if this quarterback is healthy, what is the worst this team will do? I would say it's 10 wins. And that is, again, one of the highest possible compliments I can give. Ceiling, I agree with you. It's a 12-win team. That is not a backhanded compliment. That is an absolute compliment. They have a rough schedule. They're playing in a much-improved division. They have every possibility to win that division. 12 wins is their ceiling. If Roger Goodell comes up with some compromise on Matt LaFleur and he gets sent to the gulag, <laughs> they could only win eight games. That's my floor. That's your reason? Yep. <laughs> it's not anything realistic. It's my story you and I'm sticking wanted, to it. You just wanted an excuse to say eight. Yep. That's all I got. <laughs> Please give me a sub 500 Packers team in my lifetime. It's not going to happen, dude. I know. <laughs> I don't know. What's Anthony Barr doing? Maybe he can sign <laughs> Chicago. He needs work, right? Oh, man. All right. Now we lost all the Packers fans. I, For everybody who's left. I was going to say, were they here after the opening? <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. We got one more team left in this series. We're talking about Detroit tomorrow, which is the uh, biggest obstacle to the Packers winning the NFC North. Truth be told, I'd, I'd love it if Detroit won it over them. I'd, <laughs> just give us a couple years off, guys, please. Um, so we're going to talk Detroit tomorrow. Uh, I do want to thank any and all fans that have stuck around this long. The algorithm thanks you. We thank you. Uh, make sure to check out our clothing partner, Homage, for NFL gear or Packer gear or whatever team you happen to be a fan of. Homage has gear for every single team and for bootleg. And whatever you get at our link in the description, we do get a cut of it. So it's a great way to passively support the show. Uh, or if you want to directly support the show. You can do so on our Patreon that is also linked in the description below. Uh, and also a special thank you to our executive producers uh, who have made this series possible and every series that we've done for the last uh, few years. 
all the OGs. They've been around this whole time. Uh, all right, we're going to get out of here. One more team left to go. We will see you tomorrow to talk to Detroit Lions.